All right, well, welcome everyone who's, who's here right now, and I hope that others can manage to join us here. Um, I wanted to introduce a couple of people today. First of all, uh, Fiona Galt, who is our admissions counselor for the Master of Science in Environmental Studies program at Prescott College. She actually lives and works from Vermont, and so she's not far from where I am now. <laughs> and I've worked with her for over a year. Um, Fiona. Hi, everyone. I'm Fiona. I have been working with Prescott um, for about a year now. I've been working with Muriel a little bit longer than that. And my role here is to help students that are interested in joining the environmental studies program to make sure that they have all the information they need about the program and then also to ensure that they can work through the application process. And I am going to take a moment to introduce Muriel as well. So let me just get some of her credentials up here for us. Muriel has been teaching since 1985, and she's been doing virtual education since, uh, for about 14 years. Her expertise is in molecular systemics, phylogeography, and aquatic ecology. Sorry, I had some trouble with that one. Um, but she also has a long-term interest in the human-non-human -human conflict that is increasing as we move toward an 8 billion person population and are beginning to edge other species from their habitats. She earned her degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona. And Muriel is gonna introduce us to Kristen, who is also joining us for this webinar today. All right, I would welcome Kristen Ross, a longtime colleague of mine um, and valued friend. She's a restoration ecologist with a focus on urban and human impacted landscapes. Her expertise is in invasive species management, forest ecology, and soil biogeochemistry. She teaches a wide variety of courses, uh, including ecology, environmental studies, urban ecology, conservation biology, and ecological restoration. Her PhD is in ecology and evolution from Rutgers University with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Michigan. Um, and we will get started. I want to just let everybody know that we will be recording this, um, this presentation so that others can view it in the future. And also that if it looks like I'm in a car to you, it's because I am. <laughs> My internet at home currently is not working. This is welcome to rural America, I guess. So I'll try and keep disturbances to the minimum, but in the meantime, enjoy the windows in the park behind me. When we start presenting, Kristen and I are both going to turn off our, uh, our video so that uh, to conserve bandwidth, we're both in a similar situation with respect to uh, availability of internet. And we'll come back on with faces for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So with that, let me find my... Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we are uh, going to talk about something that, you know, probably everyone's thinking about nonstop, even if you don't want to. So, um, uh, Muriel and I were talking about how we can share some information that we've been, you know, reading and tracking through the news and other scientific papers. And so I just wanted to put up um, a familiar photo here of what this uh, new novel coronis, coronavirus looks like, otherwise known as SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it causes the COVID-19 illness that people are um, you know, all over the globe are getting sick with. So um, it has this virus is a, a really clever virus. It has these spiky protein protrusions on it that um, give it its name Corona. It looks like a crown. And um, there are lots of different types of coronaviruses out there. The common cold is, is you know, um, a type of coronavirus. There are lots of many different colds that we humans get and other animals get. And then um, the, this particular coronavirus is really good at binding to cells with what are called ACE2 receptors. Um, and so the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is what that stands for. And lots of our cells um, have ACE2 receptors on them. So you find them in your blood vessels, 
and um, digestive tract and um, specifically they're very densely packed. These ACE2 receptors are densely packed on cells in your lungs. And so that's why this particular coronavirus is so devastating to um, the respiratory tract. Um, so like I said, lots of coronaviruses exist out there. Um, the, the reason this one has kind of a, been a perfect storm, so to speak, is because it can be um, carried around without the host uh, knowing that they're sick. And it spends a lot of time in your, your throat, the back of your throat and your upper respiratory system at the very beginning of infection. And so you as the host are much more likely to um, transmit it all around. And so uh, it, it does its job. It's trying to invade a host and not be too deadly, uh, but also spread you know, its genetic material around. So from an evolutionary perspective, uh, this virus is doing, um, doing its job. Next slide. So where did this SARS-CoV-2 virus, this novel coronavirus, come from? So there has been a flurry of activi activity in the scientific literature that has been going over this and hashing it out. Um, there's been a lot of conspiracy theory in the news, so I encourage everybody to do their own homework. Um, but this virus has an evolutionary history that you can see here in, in this phylogenetic tree. And um, most, the consensus from most scientists, at least right now, and of, of course, as we track this disease and take more samples from more people around the globe who have been infected by this virus, this information could change or be modified. But right now, um, this is a paper that came out, um, this phylogenetic tree here is from the paper that came out um, yesterday. So, <laughs> um, you know, these, I, I put actually the, the day date on some of these references to, to show you how literally things change by the day here in the scientific community um, in terms of, of studying this. Uh, but the SARS um, uh, Cove 2 um, link there, and Muriel, if you can click, hopefully that'll send a little um, bubble in there. I'm not sure if that'll work on your, on your, um, on your end, but the, the phylogenetic tree shows that this um, SARS-CoV-2 virus is related to um, lots of different uh, other types of viruses. Um, so Muriel, I think you're not in presentation mode anymore, because now I just see the Yeah, I just see the um, I just see the actual edit part, but I see if it'll do the presentation. But anyway, um, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in humans is closely related genetically to viruses they found in both bats and pangolins, and so the tree just shows you a hypothesized. Um, relationship here in, in, in evolutionary time of how, you know, the shorter the length of the tree, the more recently those um, two types of viruses have um, uh, diverged from each other. And so SARS-CoV-2 that you see here at the top, um, that was the SARS outbreak from 2002, 2003. And so uh, that lineage, um, um, that lineage is, uh, you know, not too far in, the, in, in back in time, basically. And so we see that these kinds of coronaviruses are carried in wildlife and domesticated animals and have been for many, many, many thousands of years. Um, next slide, please. And so what, what can result is, uh, what's called spillover. So the way that SARS-CoV-2 can jump into species has to do with human contact and increasing human contact 
with many different types of domesticated animals and wildlife. And so we'll talk about this more, uh, but I want to put this graphic up um, so that right now scientists think that there was probably an intermediate host, inter intermediary host between, um, between the bat or pangolin and humans. Uh, and the reason they think that is, again, looking at the genetic makeup of this SARS-CoV-2 virus, that um, there's different aspects of the pangolin-based virus that are very similar to the one that's infecting humans now, uh, but, they're, but it's genetically not as similar as the virus that is contained in bats. And so both, um, there's a little bit of, um, you know, hypothesizing about exactly who or what was the intermediary host here. But either way, um, humans are coming into contact more frequently uh, with wildlife, and that means also wildlife um, diseases. Uh, next slide, please. So where and how did COVID-19 spread? So just, I put up a definition here for what a pandemic actually is, you know, sort of dictionary definition, a disease that is prevalent across an entire country or a whole world. So that's what we're experiencing now. And pandemics have not been um, that rare in human history. They, they do occur. Um, what people are finding though is since the 1940s, um, global pandemics are occurring at um, more frequently than they would have been prior to the 1940s. Um, so their <clears throat> scientists have right now, as of again today, <laughs> um, come up with three genetic strains of the coronavirus in terms of how it spread around the globe. So the type A, um, of the type A strain of the virus is genetically closest to the original one that is found in bats and pangolins. So it's genetically most similar to the wildlife um, version. Type B was derived from type um, A just by two mutations. And then um, that what they're finding is type B was very slow to mutate inside of China. Um, but once it escaped outside of China, it mutated much more rapidly. And we'll, I'll show you another slide that kind of shows that in a minute. Type C is derived from type B, but just by one mutation. So B and C are very um, closely linked. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a busy little graphic here, but I, I wanted to put up um, sort of a, a method, the, the graphic of a method that scientists use to do this kind of mapping to figure out the status of a virus that you know, is novel to humans. We don't know that much about it. So um, this is a map of the strains and how they mutated. So within this map are A, B, and C. So I don't know, if, Muriel, if you can click and have my little um, bubbles. There's, there's cluster A, it's a little bit hard to see. Way down in the lower right-hand corner is um, the bat original um, virus there. And each tick mark there reflects a, a nucleotide mutation or part of the genetic material mutated. And so the bubbles there show um, cluster A, cluster B, and then cluster C is over off to the left. And the different colored circles indicate where ge geographically uh, those strains spread. And so for um, type A, uh, that cluster, which is kind of down at the lower portion, um, has kind of two subclusters. One was linked to the original um, identification of this virus in Wuhan, and the other one was found commonly in, is found commonly in America and Australia. And then cluster B, type B, which is the largest cluster, is the one that's most commonly found in uh, Wuhan right now. Um, and then type C spread over to Europe through Singapore. Um, so they're, they're, the reason that they've been doing this mapping is to try to figure out, um, 
you know, behavior of how this thing is spreading. And that will link us back to figuring out how mutations have occurred, what predictive further mutations will occur, how quickly those mutations occur, occur, which really helps scientists develop vaccines. And so this mapping, it only this figure right here only shows mapping from between December 24th and March 4th. And um, they, the scientists that, that authored this paper in April had an update saying that through the end of March, um, they continued their mapping through the end of the month of March and found that the B strain is spreading much more rapidly than the other two strains. Um, so this is the kind of mapping, this kind of phylo, it's called phylogenetic network analysis is used to um, track prehistoric migration of ancient humans. So this is a tool used um, in a different field of science, but they're using it to track uh, this virus right now. And so having people be able to give blood tests and to figure out, um, you know, or being able to track who's got the disease and where is really important for the future development of vaccines. Next slide. So what's up with bats? Why are they such good carriers of viruses? Why are they the source of, of many of these things? And Muriel's going to talk about other um, diseases that have links, original links from bats as well. And so bats evolved about 50 million years ago in the fossil record. Um, the original um, fossil record, uh, at least evidence that we have, and there are a lot of gaps in the bat fossil record, show that bats didn't have the ear structure um, or vocal cord structure, skull structure to e echolocate, um, but they were insect eaters. Um, and they were, are the only mammal to evolve powered flapping flight. So they're, they're not, probably originally they were gliding from tree to tree and they were tree dwellers. And then over, uh, you know, many millennia, they evolved to um, power their own flight, much like birds um, do. But they are the only mammal that have this capacity to power flight. And they also host many different types of viruses that cause things like coronaviruses, Ebola, Nipah, etc. that um, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but scientists are literally right now trying to study why bats are such awesome carriers of viruses. And the hypothesis is is that the energy demands of flight are so high in the body of a bat that cells start to break down. And so when cells are broken down, um, these little bits of cells, these DNA fragments, um, the genetic materials kind of floating around in the body. And so the body of the bat, uh, the, immune, the immune system of the bat can be triggered by having these kind of little bits floating around. And it can cause in a, in a, a a non-bat mammal, an inflammation response. So when we get infected by some kind of bacteria or virus, it triggers some kind of immune response if you have a healthier immune system. However, bats have a weakened response to that inflammation or that, um, uh, that those little bits floating around their body. And so they don't react as strongly to that broken up, those pieces of cells in there. And so they, scientists think that, um, uh, bats have this weakened but effective response to the cell breakdown and that means they are able to carry a lot of viruses that they get infected with but not actually be sickened by them. So again that's a hypothesis and it has to do with um, the evolution of, of powered flight and so unfortunately one response um, humans have to you know blaming bats basically is to, to kill off bats. <laughs> But we need bats. They eat an incredible amount of insects. They help us everywhere around the world control insect populations. And they also are important pollinators and um, just seed dispersers for plants in, in many parts of the tropics depend on bats for, for dispersal. Um, okay, next slide. So <clears throat> um, how do we get here? How do we get from a virus and a bat to a global pandemic that is resulting in all of us sitting in our homes most of the day and having to work or losing our jobs or homeschooling from home? Um, <clears throat> so there are lots of generalities and, and ways that this could be predicted. 
um, for this spillover to occur, occur from wildlife into humans. So our globe is ever increasing in urbanization and, and there we are Oh, we, we are very good as a species of changing our land use. And so the more you have um, people moving around encroaching on wild places uh, and you have land use change in terms of wild landscapes being converted into agriculture um, for food uh, or forest or, you know, mineral and oil extraction, for example, the more we encroach on those wild spaces, the more likely it is we will come in contact with wild animals and our domesticated animals will come in contact with wild animals. Um, obviously globalization plays a huge role. We have increased amount of air travel as more people in more countries become more affluent and are able to afford to travel. They do just like we do in the United States. Um, and then increase in global trade obviously plays a big role. Um, and then just in general the interconnectedness of humanity. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about sort of um, staying insular and protecting America first, et cetera, but that's pretty much not realistic. Um, if one part of our health system globally is weak anywhere, then that poses a threat to us everywhere. And that's a quote from Dennis Carroll, who used to head the USAID. Um, and he's been interviewed recently a couple times about his take on the coronavirus. And he, you know, is, is a predictor of more um, pandemics around the world as we continue. Um, Mary, can you click the next? So this virus, remember, was first reported in Wuhan, Hubei, where, you know, it's a highly urbanized center. It has over 11 million people in early December. So that's larger than, you know, the population of New York City. It is a major travel hub in that province and in China. And then people started being sick with this, you know, not too long before holidays um, that we celebrate in the United States and in Europe, but also the Lunar New Year, where um, many Asian countries celebrate all around the world. And so it's for those who can afford to, it's an amazing time to travel. It's your, maybe sometimes your one time a year you get vacation. And so there's a lot of within country travel in China. And then as Chinese become more affluent um, and their middle class grows, they also can afford to travel to other places. Next slide. Um, so you can do another click. Um, so another reason that we got here that's somewhat obvious is our over exploitation of resources. Our human population is growing and there's not really any sign of stopping us. Um, and so over exploitation can include things like mineral oil extraction, logging, clearing land, things that I've mentioned before. Um, and that number one driver again of spillover effects is, is land use change. So the more we encroach into areas where large densities of humans have not traditionally lived, the more we're gonna have more spillover, right? So Wildlife markets, um, people have been blaming a lot of uh, wildlife markets, um, but there are many different kinds of wildlife markets. Um, and so they, it's not just one size fits all. Um, humans have been trading and consuming wildlife for centuries and use products, um, you know, both individuals and companies harvest wildlife and plant products for many, uh, you know, reasonable uses, medicines, lab research, um, fur and skin or other animal products. Um, some of these, um, some consumption of animal products is seen as a status symbol, but a lot of people are switching their diet from a, from a vegetation-based diet to a protein-based diet as they can afford to and are raising their own animals. So that means clearing more land. And these wildlife markets do, um, are an important source of income for many people, especially in Southern China. And so, um, you know, banning them all straight out is probably not the answer because a lot of uh, markets will then be driven underground and you'll have even more black markets in trading of, of different types of animal products. So wildlife markets aren't necessarily the same as wet markets, which aren't necessarily the same as illegally trafficked um, endangered species either. But again, the more we force interaction into these wild places, the more spillover we'll experience. 
Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Switching over here. So you, you, you've seen that, that there actually are um, a lot of different causes of these things. And that uh, I wanted to just take a minute to introduce you to a few of the different ways or different kinds of um, particular uh, emerging pathogens. So the emerging infectious diseases uh, are novel pathogens. Um, and these new diseases are typically caused by pathogens we've either been previously unaware of or we were aware of, but they've changed somewhat so that they are more likely to infect us. Um, and, and these data are from a comparative study in 2008. There was a lot of actual, a lot of work uh, inspired by the original SARS pandemic back in 2002. Um, and this particular Jones et al. Uh, paper was the first one to actually look at uh, geography of outbreaks and uh, timing of outbreaks over the last 40 years. What I want you to note here is that there are various kinds of pathogens, uh, bacterial, viral, protozoans, fungi, and worms of various sorts. Uh, bacterial are actually the, the most uh, common, that is they represent more than 50% of, um, of EIDs, emerging infectious, infectious diseases. However, the ones that we're going to focus on are viral uh, pathogens because those are, are the particular ones that, that <laughs> coronavirus belongs to today. Um, but I'll show you a map that'll, you'll notice some bacterial emergences on that. Um, so just a little bit of terminology before we move forward. So a zoonotic disease is a disease that is transmitted from animals to humans. Um, for example, Lyme disease. Uh, there are also diseases that are the pathogen is transmitted between animals and humans, such as the influenza virus. And then there are human specific um, pathogens that are transmitted primarily human to humans, such as HIV, measles. However, many of these things have a zoonotic or multi-host origin. So a lot of disease that comes out originates in animals. And I'm sure you're all aware that the original um, smallpox vaccine was developed from a close relative that occurred in cows, the cowpox, um, because it was noted that people that milked cows for a living didn't tend to get smallpox. And that, that was uh, probably the ancestor of the smallpox that had jumped to humans. So a lot of things have zoonotic um, backgrounds. Um, this is a slide of the emerging, emerging infectious disease events per decade from 1940. Uh, the left graph is the number of events attributable to the various uh, pathogen uh, groups that I showed you in a prior slide. So the helminths are the worms, the fungi, the protozoa, the viruses are prions, and the bac bacteria, rickettsia type diseases. And what you can see here is that overall the trend is increasing. Um, that spike between the 80s and 90s is primarily attributed to the increased susceptibility of uh, humans during the HIV uh, emergence. And so it's, you know, it's probably an anomalous blip, but the trend is still upward. Um, if you look at the graph on the right, this breaks the disease down into zoonotic versus uh, non-zoonotic origin. And you can see that, that the zoonotic diseases are increasing uh, over time. Um, and these can come from wildlife, they can come from non-wildlife, uh, and then some of them we just really don't know yet. Um, so the viral diseases are, are a lot of them are zoonotic, and I, so I thought we'd review a, some of some of the more uh, commonly known, and these are by no means all of them diseases of the last 
30 years, I guess. Um, and just before I really launch into this, I wanted just to, to present this kind of the ecology of Ebola graph so you can see. So a host or a reservoir population would be a population within which the virus uh, normally circulates. And often these animals are not particularly affected by the, by the disease itself, um, but they, are, they harbor it. Uh, and from there it can be transmitted, if you move to the right, from, from the wildlife reservoir to other species such as primates or ungulates. Um, and occasionally humans come into close contact with primates or ungulates or bats. And at that point, the, the virus can jump to the human population and then it begins to be spread within the human population. Um, so this is a diagram of Ebola and these are the few that I've uh, selected to talk about. I'll stay on this slide for a few minutes while I just review some of these. Um, so Ebola first emerged in 1977 in South Sudan and in the D Democratic Republic of Congo in a village near the Ebola River, which is actually the namesake of the disease. It was spread by, uh, probably by fruit bats. They're thought to be the reservoir of the disease, though they're unaffected by it. And it's spread through direct contact with other blood and body fluids. So that contact between, close contact between humans and any infected animal can be a means of transmission. Uh, and examples of a means of transmission would be eating bush meat. Uh, bats are uh, hunted and eaten. Um, along with the other animals that can be affected by the virus itself. Um, and deforestation has been noted as a contributing factor in the incidence of, of uh, index cases. A lot of them have been close to recent deforestation and most recent outbreaks. Um, the average mortality of Ebola is about 50%, uh, much higher than what's estimated for the current uh, epidemic. However, uh, Ebola doesn't, isn't transferred quite as easily. You have to have close contact between body fluids, blood, tears, semen, uh, in order to, to catch it. Um, the uh, AIDS or HIV-1 first reported in 1981 in the United States. Um, this is a retrovirus and it was identified in 1983. And this virus, it looks like has jumped at least twice from primate populations in Africa, uh, from chimpanzees to humans in the early, early 20th century, and uh, from sooty mangabees in Western Africa, producing a slightly different strain, HIV-2, which hasn't spread worldwide. Um, again, the probable route of infection for HIV is through the bushmeat trade. Uh, there would be a lot of opportunity of contact with the blood of an infected animal through bites and scratches on a hunter with subsequent spread among humans. And probably the reason this became a, a real issue in the 20th century was just the uh, changes in uh, behavioral changes in sexuality and global um, movement of humans. Uh, I wanted just to mention here that, that uh, Sometimes these animals are also kept as pets, and that's another possibility for, for how, how a virus can come into the human population. With AIDS, the untreated mortality rate is 100% between 6 and 18 months after infection. Um, the third one in my little cluster here is one that you might be familiar with, the uh, West Nile virus, which is still around and out there. <laughs> Uh, this has a slightly different uh, ecology, um, and this is different from the others in that it requires a vector. It requires the mosquito to spread it, and the, this virus is spread from a mosquito biting, uh, piercing, and taking blood from an infected bird, and it turns out that their preferred bird species in this country, at least, is the robin, which likes human lawns and fields, and we're all in very close contact with those. Um, but it was, it was identified in Uganda in the 1930s, but didn't make it to the U.S. until 1999, or at least not in any way uh, that, that uh, would have made it noticed. Um, 
it's possible or even probable that climate change has had something to do with the spread of these uh, diseases that are mosquito borne. So anything that we do that affects the ecology of the globe is going to affect the range of various uh, uh, diseases. A couple of others that are sort of interesting, um, the Hanipa viruses, which include the Hindra and the Nipah virus. These are fairly recent. The uh, Hindra virus in Australia, which came, came about in 1994 and was responsible for the deaths of 13 horses in Australia in the initial outbreak. Um, turns out the owner of these animals died from the virus, indicating it could move to humans. Um, there have been multiple outbreaks in Australia since, uh, all tied to bats of the terapus, that is fruit bat or flying foxes genus. And all of these involve horses. So again, an, you, you see an intermediate host between the bat and the human. Um, humans do not seem to become infected by the bats, but by the horses. Um, and again, deforestation has been correlated with outbreaks of the Hendra virus in Australia, possibly because it, it deforestation pushes the bats out of the habitat that they would normally be traveling around in and, and brings them in close contact with horses. And you know, they're out there munching fruits and busily hanging in roosts and shedding viruses onto the ground. And so that's kind of a, a ripe situation for the transmission of disease. Hinder virus, um, I mean, Nipah virus, I'm sorry, is fairly similar. It first e emerged in South Asia in 1999 and it was in people with close contact with pigs. And it seems to contact, it seems to jump to pigs and then to humans. It, it causes fairly mild symptoms in pigs, but humans experience about a 50% mortality rate from this. This particular outbreak was controlled by slaughtering millions of pigs. And in this case, there was no human to human transmission. Um, and again, flying foxes or fruit bats identified as a pr probable reservoir. Again, it's livestock in close contact with wild populations. Um, and again, you can see that, that not all of these diseases are good at moving from human to human. And not all of these diseases are good at moving from an animal to a human. Uh, but then you get the case where a disease is good at moving from animals to humans and also good at moving from humans to humans. And you have the case of uh, our first SARS, our sort of a preview to, to what's going on now, uh, which is the preview is the SARS-CoV-1, which is kind of a practice run for 2020. Um, this was actually the first known respiratory, or known coronavirus pandemic. Um, Again, it emerged in uh, Guangdong in the uh, associated with uh, civet cats in wildlife wet markets. So people who were uh, in the food trade who were actually slaughtering and processing these. Um, and it was contained fairly quickly, um, but it emerged in late 2002. It has a very similar kind of a uh, disease progression to the current coronavirus um, emerged in late 2002. In February, it was moved from a professor in a teaching hospital who contracted the disease from patients. So here we have human to human transmission, carried it with him to Hong Kong, where in one day he infected 16 people. And then from here, it infiltrated other ho hospitals in Hong Kong and it went to Vietnam, Canada, Singapore, the Philippines, the United Kingdom. Kingdom, the United States, and then back to China. Um, March 12th, the World Health Organization issued a global alert, and on March 15th, an emergency travel advisory. Uh, they isolated the virus by late March, and by June found a 99.8 similar uh, virus in civet cats in the, uh, among wildlife present in the crowded wet markets. Um, Later research on whether this was present in wild civet cats showed that it was not, which here you just have the, the conditions that create transmission of disease. When you have an infected animal crowded in with a lot of in, other infected animals, it's really quite different from a wild population. Um, and again, horseshoe bats were, are thought to, to be the uh, 
the reservoir for these. And this, I just wanted to note that this particular virus moved from wildlife, from civet cats into humans twice, once at the beginning of the big ep pandemic, and then there were another four people infected uh, toward the end in um, 2003. So it's fairly common and coronaviruses seem to be emerging as one of the things that are, that were, we should probably be more concerned about. Um, a paper by Vincent et al that I've got references at the end of, of these slides, um, basically reviewed the, uh, the trajectory of the disease, the probable causes, uh, what made it easy to spread, what made it easy to even occur in the first place, and basically concluded that this is eating exotic animals and SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats uh, is really a time bomb. And probably what should be coupled with that is the globalization, our moving around the way we move around. So these examples are are similar to in a number of other EIDs that we could discuss. Um, and the factors they have in common include a high proportion of zoonotic origin. They're associated with close contact between wildlife and humans uh, and their livestock, consumption of wildlife, expansion of agriculture into newly deforested areas, um, other environmental factors, probably global climate change, and then we have things, socioeconomic factors and rapid population growth and poverty uh, just create what Kristen referred to as a perfect storm. So these are just the commonalities that, that are present here. Uh, and I think we've pretty well been through most of those. Uh, and so this isn't a question of if it's going to happen again. <laughs> it's a question of when and where. Um, and so as we move to thinking about solutions, um, this is clearly a place for environmental professionals. People who know how natural systems work within each other when, when they're whole and intact, how people can move into uh, natural systems with a little more finesse, what is, you know, what, what's predictable and what's not. Um, and, and so we can, there are things we can do about this, right? And this is again from Jones et al. 2008, uh, and they mapped uh, EIDs with their predictors and they, they mapped these hotspots. And the hotspots included here are areas of high biodiversity, high human density, human-animal interaction, and environmental change disrupting the ecologies. The biodiversity link is really interesting. Um, typically, this is lower latitudes, tropics, and that's probably because viruses in their host reservoir animals co-evolve. So where there's high animal biodiversity, there's probably high virus diversity as well. And that increases the chance that a virus is just a small mutation away from being able to infect a human. Um, virologists estimate that only 1% of all wildlife viruses are known to science. So there's a lot of work to be done understanding the diversity of viruses. Um, there are people out there who are trying to address this. The Global Virome Project uh, pro nonprofit that's the outgrowth of USAID's PREDICT project, which ran out of funding, uh, interestingly, this fall and is now on an emergency six-month <laughs> re-upping of funding for it. The PREDICT project was a project that was taking wildlife samples and trying to describe the full, uh, trying to describe the diversity of viruses in hotspot areas. Um, they found, they sampled 140,000 wildlife samples, identified about 100, uh, 1,200 uh, potentially pathogenic viruses, including about 160 uh, coronaviruses. So we know where to look and we know what we can do. We can minimize spillover. Kristen, I think I'll let you take over here. 
Yeah, so we wanted to kind of, uh, before we end, uh, talk about, you know, some rays of hope here that, um, you know, there's global efforts and there's local efforts that can be done. So just some um, somewhat recent uh, global efforts that are arming people nationally and locally to um, go out and protect their own biodiversity where they live. Um, one includes the UN's, the United Nations declaration that this coming decade, uh, 2021 to 2030 is the designated decade on ecosystem restoration. And so the role of declaring this decade for ecosystem restoration is to promote the sustainable development goals of the UN. There are 17 different sustainable development goals and nonprofits and local and regional and federal governments everywhere um, who are UN member states, um, member parties, are working towards um, you know, short and long-term goals or objectives to reach these 17 goals. And so the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration um, promotes an awareness globally that if we can work on restoring our ecosystems, because we are very good at disrupting them and changing them, um, where possible to galvanize uh, and encourage um, local people on the ground uh, to work towards their own ecosystem restoration um, is, is the message that the UN is trying to get out there and promote. And so, um, you know, it's not a far off non-governmental organization or go foreign government coming in and saying, um, hey, local people, you, you know, we know what's best for you. You need to stop cutting down your forests. You need to stop having trading in wildlife, et cetera. It's incentivizing local folks to discover their own um, ecosystem services within their local uh, biodiversity resources um, and helping promote find alternatives to cutting down forests and looking at ecotourism, sustainably run ecotourism programs, um, sustainably run um, non-timber forest product production um, and uh, you know, working with global companies who in the past may have had some um, questionable ethical practices. Um, some, of, some companies, global companies are sort of realizing that they need to uh, be on the right side of ecosystem restoration and, and biodiversity conservation. So, um, so those are just some global efforts that, you know, I'm sure folks are aware of. Um, and we're gearing up in the restoration community. Um, I work in ecological restoration, and so we're gearing up for this new decade, and the UN has put out a bunch of resources on this, uh, and the Society for Ecological Restoration um, in the United States and abroad ha has also um, created complementary resources that can help practitioners on the ground um, set up their own um, you know, assessments and management plans and monitoring plans to promote restoration where they live. So next slide. And then um, nationally here at home, um, we can minimize spillover that's happening, you know, farther away from us by providing uh, funding, promote, you know, encouraging our local and state and federal representatives and federal administration to continue funding proactive research. So um, all of the diseases that Muriel described in the current uh, disease, we're reacting to it. Um, it is difficult to predict, but we have a lot of the tools, like Muriel mentioned, we know, you know, we know where to look. <laughs> and so the National Institutes of Health and groups like EcoHealth Alliance, the USAID Project PREDICT, um, all of them have had funding cut, um, you know, in the past, but, but definitely more recently. Um, Muriel mentioned the PREDICT project being, um, their funding being up last fall. EcoHealth Alliance on April 24th just had, the NIH just cut their funding 
literally to be looking at bats <laughs> for um, looking for, you know, they were doing direct research on the ground specific to the current pandemic. Um, and that funding source was just cut because of the perspective that we need to only be funding American scientists. Well, when these diseases are arising outside of the United States, um, you know, there's only so much American scientists can do. We have to collaborate on the ground with international scientists and their international institutions. Um, and so it's fairly ridiculous to think that, um, you know, organizations, whether non-governmental organizations or governmental funded institutions just can't work with certain groups of people. So, um, you know, advocating on behalf of those scientists who are doing the work on the ground um, is something we can do at home. Um, we can also fight for the increase of enforcement against wildlife trafficking and trading, especially in uh, endangered species. And, um, you know, there are wildlife markets where people buy fresh fruits and vegetables as well as seafood. So again, not all wildlife markets are created equal and to, you know, have a crackdown on the ones that promote illegal trade of, of endangered species, for example, um, and then highly regulate wildlife markets is something that, again, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations can help build capacity for local level governments in other countries to work on. And again, if we have sort of this America first um, perspective, those kinds of efforts um, can definitely become weakened, especially if uh, the United States, who's a global leader financially, um, should be able to help promote these um, through capacity building, but also through funding. Uh, and then I encourage everybody to do your own research. Um, David Quammen, who's, who's an amazing science writer, um, put out this book called Spillover prior to the current pandemic, um, but there are lots of uh, uh, wonderful articles written in various science journals and science writers who help translate the science speak in some of these, um, some of these articles that, you know, don't rely on someone else's information, you know, do some research yourself, so. Next slide. So uh, we wanted to stop here and leave you with a few resources and we have time to take a few questions. Um, we need to continue to support human populations, but also understand their ecological context and put in public health measures that make sense so that we have thriving communities, both natural and human. Uh, so I will turn back on my video, I think. And we can, you can type into the chat. And I will stop my screen share. There we are. Okay. So if you have a, a a question, you're welcome to type it in um, or you can send me an email. <laughs> uh, let's see here. What do we have? Okay. Uh, folks, I'm here as well to answer any questions you might have about the admissions or application process. So if there was anything specific to the Prescott program, um, feel free to uh, leave a little note of that as well. And if if you have other questions uh, or would like to have the references from the talk, um, happy to connect those to you. My my uh, email address is on the Prescott website under the Master of Science in Environmental Studies program. And I'm always happy to talk to somebody who's interested. Jamie, I'd be happy to email you the links that were listed on the last page of that 
uh, presentation as well. If anyone else is interested in having that last page of the presentation emailed out to them, drop your email in the chat or shoot me a text and I will send that on over. The recording, Casey, the recording is going to be uh, shared on Facebook, or I'm sorry, not on Facebook, on YouTube. It's going to be available on the Prescott College YouTube channel. I'll just put a plug in for um, one of the resources we listed on the last slide is the um, PBS air is airing for free right now, uh, the documentary called Spillover. And it was made before this current pandemic, but it talks about um, three countries pretty much focuses on that and talks about some of the um, infectious diseases that Muriel was talking about, uh, the historic ones and sort of how scientists are working on the ground to, you know, medical professionals and epidemiologists and uh, wildlife biologists and ecologists are working together to combat um, the unknowns about where some of these sources have come from and how they're spread. So um, that's just something you can Google, go to pbs.org and Google spillover, or put it search spillover in there and I, you can watch that for free. And there are educator resources along with that film um, so if you are teaching students or want to educate others, there's some ideas there for that. Or if you have home, homeschool, high school, or junior high students at home, you might want those as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. It was great to see everybody. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks everyone for hosting. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Kristen and Muriel. Sure. Take care. Thank you.